And I'd like to welcome Congressman Quigley, Senator Durbin, who I know are very excited to talk to you today about their trip, what they've learned, their insights, and uh, what that means for all of us living back here in Chicago, uh, what it means in, in Washington, what it means for democracy. So why don't we start with Senator Durbin and uh, some opening remarks, and then we'll go to, Senator, uh, to Congressman Quigley. Thanks, Ravi, Steve, and my friend, uh, Mike Quigley. Uh, it's an honor to be back and to uh, report to you, as I have before, about my recent uh, trip. Uh, over the break, uh, Congressman Quigley and I uh, had a limited amount of time, but we both decided independently that we were going to Ukraine, uh, and we met there. We started in different places, but we spent the end of our trip in Ukraine together. Uh, and I want to report to you that the trip included three stops for me. The first stop was in Warsaw, Poland, the second stop in Vilnius, Lithuania, and the third in Kyiv. Why did I pick those three? Because two years ago, I went to the same three places. Why would I go back now? I went back for obvious reasons. We have a new president, and there are many questions that are being asked in these countries about the relationship of the United States with each of those countries in the future. <clears throat> Secondly, there are many questions still being asked about the relationship of the United States and the new administration to Russia and Vladimir Putin. There is no bigger single topic in those countries than Putin, for obvious reasons. Uh, I don't need to tell anyone in this room, and I have some friends here from the Lithuanian community, and I'm sure there are others, we have a memory. We remember. We remember not that long ago when these countries were under the control and dominance of the Soviets, don't we? And we know what it meant for the people of Ukraine, for Lithuania and Poland and so many other countries. They were denied their basic rights. I thank the clergy for being with us here today. But in the day under the Soviets, the practice of religion was severely restricted. And that has changed. With freedom has come an opportunity to live your faith, exercise your faith in a free way. That was one of the things freedom of the press, freedom of the speech. I won't dwell on it. We all remember that history, that dark history. So the questions they're asking, new president, what is your policy? Why do we hear all these things about Vladimir Putin being a superhero uh, in the United States? Where does that come from? When it came to Poland and to Lithuania, they were asking about NATO. What does NATO mean now? Uh, is it uh, still something where we can trust that if we need you, you will be there? When we went to Ukraine, since Ukraine is not a member of NATO, the question was different. Now that we have been invaded by the Russians in Ukraine, will you stand by us? Will you help us to continue this struggle? So those were really fundamental questions. They call them existential questions, questions of survival, questions of existence. Uh, I was able to meet in uh, Warsaw uh, with the leaders of the government and uh, I felt that it was a good, strong relationship. We have the Illinois National Guard is a partner of the Polish Army. They work together, they train together. It's been a partnership for 20 years, and they're proud of it, we are too. When I went to Lithuania, uh, some of you know my mother was born in Lithuania. I went to Lithuania uh, to see uh, the president, Grabuskaiti. We met in Vilnius talked about these issues, and it was all about NATO, and it was all about Russia. She is, and it is a small country, as you know, but she is in a constant battle with Putin. They call it the hybrid war. It is a war that includes the military, it includes cyber attacks, and it includes propaganda. Some of you may have seen RT. Have anybody seen RT, the cable network? If you travel, you'll see it for sure. This is a propaganda arm of Putin and Moscow. At one point, President Grabuskaite closed them down in Lithuania and said, you are saying so many false things, we won't let you do that. Well, just before we arrived, a, German, a group of German military under the flag of NATO had come to Lithuania to help. What did Putin do? He started an unfounded rumor that one of the German soldiers had raped a Lithuanian girl. It was not true, but you know why he said it. He wanted to create this fear and antagonism toward the NATO forces. 
That is what Lithuania is up against all the time. But when we go to Ukraine, it is not just a propaganda war. It is a real war. People are dying in Ukraine, fighting for Ukraine and its freedom. We were lucky. Mike and I, Congressman Quigley and I, came in late one night, and we arrived, and President Poroshenko said, I want to meet with you, 9 o'clock at night. They work overtime in Ukraine. Uh, and he did meet with us. He couldn't have been more gracious. And we had a lengthy meeting. We talked about a number of things. First, we talked about security and his concern that the Russians, just before we arrived, had started a new initiative. We're showing more military force. Now, we know what's happened, sadly, with Crimea. They have taken it over. And we get reports of how terrible life is in Crimea for the people who are still there. The Tatars are being discriminated against. The people who live there are now feeling what looks like Soviet rule again in this Crimean section. When we go over to the Donbass and start talking about what they are doing, we are still holding the line there to keep them from advancing. But people continue to fight and die in Ukraine. What President Poroshenko asked is that the United States continue to help and do more if we can. I said to him, what can we do? What would you like the United States to do? He gave me an interesting answer. He said, in Budapest, we gave up a thousand nuclear warheads in, in Ukraine. We said, we'll give them back so that you don't have to fear that they'll get into the wrong hands. He said, we gave back a thousand nuclear warheads. Will you give us a thousand anti-tank missiles so that we can stop the Russian tanks from coming into our country? That's not an unreasonable request from him. I personally, you know I supported President Obama, but I thought we should have done more. I think we should have been sending more what they call lethal aid, serious military aid to make sure that the Russians do not advance. The second part of the conversation, and I'll stop because I want Congressman Quigley to have a chance to share his thoughts as well. As you're in Kyiv and you look east you're looking at Russia. As you look at Kyiv and West, you're looking at reform. Big challenges, serious challenges. Is there good news? I think there is. We have seen over 2% economic growth in the last year in Ukraine, and for a long time, there was no economic growth. The economy was contracting. Now it's starting to grow again. That's a positive thing. Secondly, we are seeing reform in Kyiv and in Ukraine in some significant areas. I think one of the most significant is the reform of the judiciary. Many of them, going back to Yanukovych and before, are corrupt. That you can't count on them to enforce the laws. That they take bribes. And that companies don't want to come to Ukraine for fear that there won't be any rule of law. So they have started the replacement of the traditional judiciary with new people, which is an important part of it. Uh, I think that is moving in the right direction, and we should encourage it. For all of the terrible things that Putin has done in Ukraine, what he has done has had one very positive impact, I believe. We do polling in Ukraine. We read polling in Ukraine. The people of Ukraine feel closer to the West today than they did several years ago when Yanukovych left. They believe their future is in the West. Their future is with Europe instead of looking toward Moscow. So what Putin tried to do was to frighten them away from that, and it didn't work. They are strong, independent, determined people. And the more, the harder he pushes them, the more they want to rule their own country and their own future. It, I'll just turn it over to my friend, Congressman Quigley. Uh, I was here at a rally in the cold when people were freezing and dying in the Maidan in 2014. So. Uh, at your request, uh, I went to Kyiv uh, about a month after that. And we were also joined by the clergy that came with us to Washington, D.C. when the president came to speak to a joint session of Congress. I got him to sign a program, by the way, that I think is still hanging in the museum here. So it's, it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, so in Kyiv in 2014, it was a, a dangerous time. Uh, and we were meeting with those who were going to run for office. And what I saw there was hope. 
right? In the midst of all that danger and turmoil, I saw hope. And when Senator Durbin and I were in Kyiv just recently, I saw the same thing. Through the difficult times of democracy building, tough in any country, after Yanukovych stole two full years of the government's budget, right? and the history of corruption that existed from that Soviet era, overcoming that, and the extraordinary fighting in the East. I saw an extraordinary change, though, a promise that this is going to happen, that Ukraine will get past this. Also recognizing that it won't happen unless we maintain our allies and our friendship. How important we understand that our allies in NATO and Eastern Europe are, and how important the relationship is between the Ukrainian community here and Ukraine, and our friends in Ukraine and the United States as a whole. So that's what I took for it. It's, I'm proud to be on the Ukrainian caucus. I'm proud to be your congressman here, and especially the important things that we do together, working on legislation. When we were in, um, Ukraine, the senator was talking about a bill that said that only the sanctions on Russia for its occupation can only be removed by Congress. <laughs> Our message in Ukraine was, whatever concerns you have about the White House right now, and they're legitimate, we believe that the majority of members of the House and Senate, bipartisan, bicameral, are going to stand by Ukraine on these sanctions and the aid that the Ukrainians need today and on we, as we go forward. I'm firmly convinced they are still there. Thank you. <laughs> you have my further commitment that we're going to continue to do this aid in a wide variety of forms. As a member of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, we authorize the intelligence community two years in a row as the sponsor on the House side. We were able to authorize about $15 million for enhanced, uh, ins uh, enhanced communication equipment because, quite frankly, when this began and the Ukrainians were fighting for their lives, uh, they knew that the Russians were listening, right? The Soviet area era still it was in existence there. So that information and that communication is absolutely critical. We're going to continue to do that. And as a member of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, I am one of nine Democrats in the House investigating the Russian involvement in our democratic process. Ladies and gentlemen, it is The most important thing I've done so far in Congress, and its mission is the most important thing we can do going forward. However anyone feels about the election, the encroachment upon our democratic actions, and the fact that this isn't Putin's first foray into this, right? He is also hacking into our utility system. This joint effort with all of you is all about our democracy and maintaining our homeland security, our national security, and our economic well-being. That's what I look forward to working with you all as we go forward. Thank you so much. Do you think, Senator, and Congressman, you weigh in as well, that what Putin is after here is not just real politic, who has the advantage today and tomorrow and in economics and what have you, but it's about, it's about the way we live. Is that what's at stake here? It's interesting because Putin was caught uh, in a conversation in a microphone years ago saying to President George W. Bush, Ukraine is Russia. Ukraine is not a separate country. He said Ukraine is Russia. That's what Putin believes. And if you look at what he's done, that's what he's saying. They're not entitled to be a separate nation. They are part of Russia. They always will be in his eyes. Crimea, you know, that changed hands back in the 1950s. Uh, under Khrushchev when he decided to make it part of the Ukrainian Republic of the Soviet Union. But I think there's something equally important. I think what Putin is setting out to do is for his own political benefit at home. Because if he shows that he's fighting back against the West, 
And he, and he can convince the Russian people to ignore all the problems they have in Russia and instead focus on our common enemy, NATO, Ukraine, then they rally around him. This man makes no bones about it. He says he wants to restore the Soviet empire. I believe him. I don't have any doubt that this former KGB agent wants to restore the Soviet empire. And that means putting pressure on everyone. Think about what Ukraine went through after Yanukovych was removed. When it came to energy, it was blackmail. Putin was saying to them, we're going to raise the prices of your energy. He, he, he uh, mistook the ingenuity and thinking of the Ukrainian people. They figured out how to bring that energy back in from Europe so they could fight him. And they are moving toward independence. I might add, while I'm on that subject, because Mike and I talked to President Poroshenko about that, one of the reforms was in the energy area. And it was not popular. They said, we're going to stop the government subsidy for your utility bills. And it meant that in some cases, the cost of the monthly utility bill went up three or four times. Then people started thinking twice about using too much energy if they didn't need it. But it's been politically difficult to move some of these reforms through. But Ravi, to your basic point, I believe that Putin looks for weakness. He looks for weakness. When he saw weakness in Georgia, what did he do? He invaded Georgia. When it looked like weakness and a change of government in Ukraine, what did he do? He invaded Crimea. He invaded Ukraine. He did it with these black little green men, whatever they call them. We know who they are. He's looking for weakness in the, in the Baltics. He's looking for weakness in Poland. I'm not a Cold War warrior who's said, you know, we've got to be ready to fight, 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 but I'm a realist. And I know what he's all about. Mike? Yeah, I, when I was in Kyiv in 2014, my delegation met um, the former president's chief of staffs. Um, and he said very clearly, it is Putin's goal to restore the Soviet Union, and it begins with Ukraine. So I learned at the very beginning that was the goal. I think the message for us today is the, uh, the senator mentioned going to other uh, Baltic states. Uh, I was, in Lithu I was in Lithuania and Georgia over the summer and Latvia just before I came to Kyiv this time. It is clear they all recognize the same thing. And when President Trump's people talked about Estonia being a suburb of St. Petersburg, it's clear what we're talking about. The message against Putin must be one of strength and unity unity within NATO and unity especially for those countries the most vulnerable. When I was in Georgia, it wasn't reading a newspaper about it. You could watch the Russians moving the fences. Folks, you can go online and see pictures of a woman, a farmer, feeding her cow through a fence because overnight the Russians had moved the fences. Putin sees any sort of weakness as a green light. And the Russians have always exploited weakness or some sort of crisis back to Suez as an opportunity to exploit that. And his goal now is to create disharmony, disunity in the West that he can exploit as he takes these overt and covert measures, particularly now in Eastern Europe. The same types of thing we've seen here in the United States. So it's, it's come to the United States. The fight has come here in that vein. We have to join in it and be unified.